over half of all active satellites in Earth orbit today have been launched in just the past four years as part of SpaceX's Starlink project, just one of several planetary scale internet service providers working to deliver internet connections to anywhere on the planet. These systems are a big step forward toward a more connected world and have enormous potential to help the nearly 3 billion unconnected and poorly connected people on our planet that happen to live in areas that lack infrastructure, democratic governments, affluence, or all three. In the cost-benefit equation for planetary scale ISPs, the benefits are clear. Both to operators like SpaceX, who will make billions of dollars in subscription revenue, and to the poorly connected people of the world. We can actually put some numbers to the value of being connected. The World Economic Forum estimates that a 10% increase in just basic internet access, I mean just very, very basic internet access, will increase the developing country's GDP by 1.2%. A similar increase in broadband access yields an even bigger increase in economic activity. However, the costs of these systems are unclear, hard to calculate, and many of which will be borne by all of humanity, present and future. What is the price that you would put on the night sky? While one can typically see a few satellites in the sky during the early evening or early morning, the number of objects that are being launched today is going to change that stargazing experience from the excitement of spotting a satellite to sheer overwhelm. Astronomers have estimated that we'll be able to see over 2,000 satellites during certain times of the night. Today's newborns are going to experience the night sky very differently than any humans born in the last 300,000 years. The costs on the ground are going to go beyond aesthetics and will exact a toll on ground-based astronomy as well. While SpaceX has attempted to reduce the satellite reflections by adding light-absorbing coatings, these are still far from effective. Astronomers estimate that these coatings would have to be 100 times dimmer to be effective, something that many believe is beyond the range of physical possibility. Radio astronomy will also be affected worldwide. Even when a satellite is not directly overhead, it emits radio energy via side lobes. These are artifacts of the transmission process that will interfere with radio astronomy. And it's unclear whether this can be successfully mitigated or not. While satellites are relatively small, you can't put thousands of them in orbit without there being issues. They travel at tens of thousands of miles per hour. They cover a lot of distance very, very quickly. Collisions in space are exceptionally dangerous. The Chinese space station and other satellite operators have had to change their orbits in order to avoid Starlink satellites. This problem will only get worse as there's more objects and more people in space. Along with the exponential increase in satellites in space has come an exponential increase in the amount of debris in space much of it caused by the launch process itself. Other bits are created when debris or derelict satellites crash into each other, or when nations actually test anti-satellite weapons technology. There are over 128 million pieces of space debris that are larger than one millimeter in size. Of those, 34,000 are greater than 10 centimeters in size. But even small bits of debris can cause enormous damage due to their extreme velocities. The combination of a large number of objects in space and a large amount of space debris can lead to a cascade of collisions, known as the Kessler Syndrome. Unlike in the movies, where this process takes off very quickly, NASA scientist Donald Kessler has said that this process can best be thought of as continuous and has already started. If we don't confront this growing threat, we may find, at worst, 
that certain parts of low Earth orbit are unusable for a generation or more. At best, it's going to significantly increase the cost and complexity of space operations and launch operations. Planetary scale ISPs also introduce a new set of geopolitical questions, challenges, and potential costs. Because these are not just one more internet service provider competing for subscribers within a nation's borders. They are something different. They are companies whose service area is not defined by national borders and for which users only need a small terminal in order to be able to access. Now this can be a blessing as we've seen in Ukraine. There, the Starlink service was activated shortly after the Russian invasion and tens of thousands of terminals were shipped into the country and put toward military and civilian usages. But not all countries want easy to set up unfiltered internet access for their citizens. Iran, for example, is another place where Starlink is active, but is actually not authorized to be activated there. Dissidents have smuggled hundreds of terminals into the country in order to avoid the government's blockages of the internet. Now, Iran has not taken action against these Starlink users yet, but it could triangulate the location of Starlink terminals and hunt these dissidents down. Iran is also capable of launching objects into low Earth orbit and could attack the Starlink network directly with a kinetic kill vehicle, essentially setting off a Kessler syndrome on purpose. As history has shown, authoritarian governments don't always act in the best interests of the world, but more in their own perceived best interest when they feel threatened. This will become especially tricky in countries that allow Starlink services and terminals, but also routinely block internet access for political reasons. This will come to a head shortly in India, where Starlink is negotiating to deploy its services, but that country also routinely blocks internet access ahead of elections. It also has millions of unconnected people. SpaceX's founder, Elon Musk, also owns another enterprise called Tesla Motors that would like to sell a lot of cars in India. And under Musk's leadership, one of his more recent acquisitions, called Twitter at the time, blocked a BBC documentary that was critical of the Indian Prime Minister. There's a large overlap between the investors in Tesla and the investors in SpaceX, and pressure could be exerted on multiple fronts. Here, the cost of democracy could be very high indeed. Now, I know I sound like a pessimist, but I promise you I'm not. I'm optimistic that humanity can work out a way forward that balances these costs and benefits appropriately. And there's reason for my optimism. Space, like our seas, belongs to all of humanity. On our seas, we have maritime laws that define things such as fishing and navigation and humanity's collective use of this great resource. In space, we also need clear rules, collective action, and a sense of shared stewardship. We cannot leave solving this equation up to just some visionaries or some outpace government agencies. Humanity's future is going to be determined by how we operate on the internet and how we operate in space. We all have an interest here. Let's solve this equation together. Thank you. <laughs>